This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. This is World AIDS Day Worldwide. You are listening to Joy 94.9. This is Glenn Dalton. And this hour we are talking about no one being left behind, particularly in relation to we do know that uh, some communities are adversely vulnerable to HIV AIDS. And uh, one of those is sex workers. I'm joined uh, live on the line by two representatives from the Scarlet Alliance, which is an organisation that works towards sex worker rights. Um, Janelle Fawkes is the Chief Executive Officer and... And uh, Cameron Cox is the uh, male sex worker representative. What do we know about uh, the vulnerability of the community? Well, we know that a number of factors make us vulnerable to HIV. That um, one of the main factors is the legislative framework. And that's because it can make it very difficult for us to access healthcare services, for us to um, implement safe sex practices with our clients and also to access um, treatment. Um, We also know that, and of course, sex workers around the world are advocating for decriminalisation. Decriminalisation, importantly, removes police as the regulators of the industry. Um, So it cuts out that opportunity for harassment um, and um, that many sex workers do experience when police are the regulators. Um, But importantly also, um, we're in a situation in our region where many sex workers just can't access condoms and many other sex workers can't access treatment. Um, So there are some really um, major infrastructure and major problems for sex workers in the region. Uh, Cameron, I'll bring you in at this point. Do you have anything to add uh, to what Janelle's saying there? Um, Yeah, I might add that also in our region, um, condoms being used as evidence of sex work where sex work is illegal is a huge problem. So what do you mean by that, Cameron? I mean that if you're um, out in public and or in a sex work situation or an assumed sex work situation in many countries and you're carrying um, a condom, um, then you'll be then assumed to be doing sex work and arrested. Isn't that, uh, isn't that baffling? That is Indeed. completely baffling. It even exists in developed countries, um, the United States especially. So, I mean, what we're hearing here is that there are real enormous infrastructure, legislative and attitude barriers that uh, are really affecting the sex worker community or the the region. Um, Yes, we are. Sex workers work like any other form of work, but unfortunately in many jurisdictions, legislated or heavily regulated. Sounds like you've got a plane going over you there, Cameron. Uh, I think you are. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, that, that's good. So w- when we look at uh, some of these uh, very significant barriers, uh, it's clear that they're creating um, these uh, extreme ongoing vulnerability for HIV in, in the region. Um, where do we go with that? What, what, what do we need mm-hmm. to do with that? Okay, well, we need to um, address the legislation to start with. We need political will to roll back that legislation and work towards decriminalisation. Here in New South Wales, we're lucky to have almost full decriminalisation and it's given us excellent sex worker health outcomes. What what does the research show in terms of uh, the link between decriminalisation and the health outcomes, Uh, Janelle? Well, it shows very clearly that decriminalisation um, improves sex workers' access to health services. Um, The LASH study um, by Basil Donovan and others at the Kirby Institute compared three different states um, with three different models of regulation, and it showed very clearly that where the sex industry is decriminalised, in fact, it stated that it has the healthiest sex industry of Australia. But from a sex worker point of view, and I should say I am a sex worker, um, from our point of view, it also enables us to access services when we need to. If we experience um, a criminal problem, we're able to access police and expect that they're going to um, take us seriously and act on our complaints. Um, We can, in other states and territories, also access anti-discrimination protection, which is extremely important. Because even as sex workers here in Australia, we experience things like 
uh, newspapers charging us several times more than anybody else to put ads in the paper, etc. Right, and that's uh, apparently mm. within the legislation. Well, it's allowed within legislation. Where anti-discrimination protection covers sex workers, then we could take a case forward and it wouldn't be allowed. Um, but um, that we only have that coverage in a few states in Australia. Yeah, I mean, the, it does paint this picture that there is this uh, extreme vulnerability to this particular population uh, for a, a range of things, but uh, in terms of uh, HIV, AIDS, what are the barriers towards being able to change uh, some of these attitudes? Why, why, what are your perceptions, maybe mm. I'll start with you, Cameron, that uh, these attitudes have not changed? Um, I really have no idea why mm. these attitudes haven't it's changed. It's not an as easy a question, is it? <laughs> as a sex worker, I see sex work as any, the same as any other type of work and most sex workers or all sex workers see it that way. Our clients probably see it that way, but there are members of the general public and especially the media who like to demonise us at all times. And um, they run campaigns against us only on moral grounds. I mean, this sort of moral, these moral grounds, uh, uh, it, it is at the expense, obviously, of uh, people's health. It definitely is, yes. I, th I think on that point, um, you know, what is the barrier to legislative um, change moving forward? It's a good question because particularly with your heading of um, who's being left behind, I do think as far as legislative change goes, um, sex workers and drug users in Australia are being left behind, but not just in Australia, throughout the region. Um, and I think one of the main barriers is we have the evidence but unfortunately, in politics right now, evidence isn't driving policy change. Yeah. So we have very strong evidence that, in fact, decriminalisation is the best practice model for sex industry regulation in relation to both, importantly, the human rights of sex workers, but also for our occupational health and safety and our ability to um, negotiate safe sex practices with our clients and prevent that police harassment we were talking about. But yet... That, um, you know, a very strong theme at the ICAP conference in Bangkok recently um, was, you know, where is that political will? When we talk about the three zeros, you know, mm -hmm. there has, has been zero action on law reform, zero um, political will to make those kind of changes that are needed and zero funding for communities um, that need it. So if we look at our region, um, unfortunately, there may have been quite a, quite a bit of money going towards services for sex workers, yet very, very little of it is making it to sex worker communities in the region to um, come together, organise effectively and do that community response that has been so sex, sex successful for us here in Australia. Yes, indeed. It's uh, such an important topic and such an important conversation. We certainly do invite any comments that you might have out there. Uh, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, email on air at joy.org.au or, your, or use the Twitter hashtag Joy World AIDS Day. An important part of this debate is the use of uh, medications such as uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis in the sex worker trade or mm -hmm. sex worker community. Um, Namondi Mahali Maji is a leading sex worker advocate and has recently been completing research into the use of PrEP with uh, sex workers. She spoke to Dean Beck a couple of days ago and this is uh, what she had to say. Let's have a quick listen to this interview. We're speaking with Mickey Meiji. She is a leading sex worker advocate and <coughs> HIV prevention and human rights activist. She's undertaken a research program that engages populations in what they think about pre-exposure prophylaxis and the concept of treatment as prevention. She's presenting this at the ICASA mm -hmm. conference in Cape Town on the 9th of December and she joins us now. Welcome, Mickey. Hello. Thank you. Now, what was the main motivation for you uh, undertaking this research? Because I guess uh, the idea that uh, taking a pill to prevent HIV is a very new one. My uh, motivation came from after I was 
being involved in the drafting of our current NSP, which runs from 2012 to 2016, and um, which has yeah. operational guidelines for key populations in South Africa and on three diseases, HIV, STIs, and tuberculosis. They reflected nothing uh, in terms of what key populations are thinking, and um, key populations were never consulted uh, when we started having these conversations around um, treatment as prevention or pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I thought... Um, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Key populations weren't consulted, and yet uh, ultimately they were the most. Okay, so there was never any consultation with key populations in relation to TASP or PrEP in South Africa, and they are the most affected or maybe the most beneficiary to, to this. But also, as an activist, I wanted a notion of nothing for us about us. So let's hear from the people who are actually going to use the, the product uh, in terms of what do they think, their fears and hopes. Initially, what was their reaction when you uh, wanted to include them in this relatively new idea at the moment? Um, when when I actually spoke to them, they, expo they, they okay. When it comes to pre-exposure prophylaxis, their op opinions were quite divided. There were certain people who are con yes, who certain people raised concerned uh, concerns around um, will this have um, you know um, side effects, which are questions that we couldn't answer at the time, which will then lead us to actually go going back and finding those answers for them and issues around budget because I mean in Africa especially also, I mean in most African countries as, as well as South Africa we have budget constraints we are already having stock outs for people who actually need treatment to live um, when they are HIV positive so what are we saying are we saying that everybody will take these prevention and there was also behavior change um, thing about you know ideas or concerns that were raised by people and also the issue that it, does, it only prevents HIV HIV, but what about, um, you know, STIs and um, unwanted pregnancies? Were there any concerns around uh, stopping treatment, uh, the, the, the starting and stopping of treatment? Yes, there were a lot, um, both for treatment as prevention and, and PrEP, um, especially with the sex worker groups that I spoke to or the sex worker individuals. They expressed um, the current legal framework that is not conducive enough for them to be able to adhere to, to this because you know, the, the, the way the law is being enforced as well gives them a problem. Now, how did you manage to uh, set up and go about doing this research? So I collaborated with uh, organisations that are already working with key populations. I spoke to 152 individuals in four different provinces in South Africa. And um, and I used Sisonke, the national network of sex workers, um, for them to put me in contact with sex workers. And in various um, provinces, I worked with different um, uh, organizations that worked with the other key population groups that I spoke to, which were men who have sex with men and also transgender um, persons. And who did you work alongside with uh, to carry out this research? Um, so I I had the support from Amy Shea at um, from from GNP Plus. Uh, I had all the support that I needed from the global network of people living with HIV, and of course um, it was supported financially by AVEC. The, the Global Advocacy for HIV Prevention. And um, in South Africa, I worked with organizations like SWET, the Sex Worker Education and Advocacy Task Force for Sex Workers. And I worked with um, EPOC um, for the LGBTI community and um, also the National Association of People Living with HIV in Johannesburg, Sisonke, the Movement for Sex Workers and many other organizations like the East London High Transmission Area. Is there a proposed uh, delivery date for this type of uh, uh, medical intervention? Um, not yet, but um, two weeks ago we had a consultation um, that focused just on sex work and, and, and pre-exposure prophylaxis and um, sex workers were also involved from various sex workers from the region and also we had sex workers from India talking about, about this and even though in, in my, um, in my uh, consultation with um, the key populations, even though it is not um, already on policy, I, I came across one individu individual who was already taking PrEP and um, he had been on PrEP for over a year. We hear stories about that uh, with uh, people taking the medication of their friends or um, managing to get it uh, perhaps uh, from overseas illegally uh, for the, I guess, self-medication uh, in, in the PrEP sense. So um, was that 
the case of the individual that you discovered? Oh, this individual actually shared his experience, and I have it on. I, ha I have I have a quote by him that um, he has been taking. He says it's it's at first it was difficult, but then in the long run he got used to it, and he knows that it's good for him. So he actually quoted and said in, in in the beginning it was very difficult. My explanation to my friends to keep myself safe and them safe. I have to take it. More than a year now, I'm fine. They, I mean, there is good and there and there is bad. The good side is that you keep yourself safe and healthy. So he's he's quite he, he's quite positive about it. But I mean, in regards to having medication from friends, I heard about that. But in relation to PEP, from one um, sex worker in um, person who was in Johannesburg, who was a male sex worker. Um, he expressed that whenever it is that he had a client that had forced himself or maybe he was tempted to take more money, then he would then go back to um, to his client and I mean to his friends and take medication so that he prevents from the virus from acquiring in his body. And that is like PEP, not PrEP. <laughs> Indeed it is. It's an interesting evolution of how uh, various uh, key groups have taken on board what is an evolving message. Um, Mickey, can you tell us what you uh, came about finding? What was the outcomes of your research? Mm, the, the outcomes were not giving me whether a yes or a no for both interventions, but um, what I could, I could, I, I would conclude is that um, we have to um, consider both medical interventions for those sex workers or men who have sex with men or transgender persons who need it, and and making it as a as an option because we do we do know that the current ones that we that we are already having on board are not working for everybody. They are working for certain individuals. In your opinion, should that be available at the state's cost? In the in the context of South. Africa and maybe many African countries, I would want to say yes. But as well as um, there, there also is a recommendation from, from all key populations that um, due to the current legal framework, especially for sex workers, it is impossible to adhere. Even if we do make this intervention, it, it will always be hindered because we have a situation here in South Africa where cops arrest sex workers for having condoms on them. And there was a concern from sex workers that if they uh, prioritize in terms of PrEP, this, then this will make them more vulnerable to the police because if the police found the PrEP product in your bag, they would then use this as evidence that you are indeed a sex worker. And deliberately going about perhaps endangering people's lives, as they might term it. Yeah, because, I mean, they are sex workers are always blamed for, for most things. Of course, yes. Now... Out of your research, was there anything particularly that took you by surprise? What, what took me by surprise mostly was that I, I tried to speak to people who were at the very, very grassroots and um, maybe not surprised, but I was actually impressed by the fact that there were many people who were empowered in the sense that um, when I asked them a question, now that you know about PrEP or TASP, would this change your behavior um, in terms of how you have sex, how many people you have sex with, and and pe people who are adamant that I will still use condoms um, because this does not prevent me from acquiring STIs, this does not prevent me from, uh, you know, getting pregnant, uh, you know, unintent unintentionally. And um, they, 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 there is one person who said, from Musina, a sex worker, who said, I won't sleep without a condom because PrEP only protects against HIV, not STIs or unwanted pregnancies. Now, Tommy, uh, you deliberately wanted to engage these key populations and empower them in this conversation and, and get them on the radar as far as uh, this new medical technology is concerned. Do you think you achieve, uh, achieved uh, their engagement with this issue? Actually, um, I've achieved um, partially. Um, not everybody will be on board, board quite quickly, and not all of those individuals will actually be advocates. But we, I've, 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 I've actually managed to get the word out there and also raise an awareness around what PrEP is and what um, your TASP is and what it would mean for people. Um, and, and also just to say, to also capacitate them in knowing that this is what they can still ask for like in terms of if there are gaps, if they feel that there are not much benefits for them to start using the product, then they should, they, they should ask for more research so they, they do know about this. How influential is your research going to be uh, with government and, and agencies 
in delivering this to key populations? Um, I think it's going to be very influential because currently there is a hype around sex work and also key populations in the country. Um, SANEC, uh, the South African National AIDS Council, is actually launching the sex worker operational plan on the 10th of December during ICASA. So I think this feeds into that and seeing that SANAC has been working closely with the, with the same organizations that I have been working with in, in mobilizing these individuals that we spoke to. Uh, do you think that in the long term this is going to be beneficial for those uh, who were a part of your study and, and the people that they represent? Yes, it's going to be um, uh, you know, beneficial for, for people that want to take it, provided it's not mandatory and there are no human rights violations or coercions that are involved, then it will be beneficial. Is there any concern around that? Yes, there is, because um, most people raised um, an issue around whenever it is that they, they presented themselves at the healthcare center, that if they had signs of either a an, an STI or any or maybe tuberculosis, they would then be coerced into testing. And I have personal experiences of this as well. I've seen this happening in right before my eyes. Like I'm a woman living with HIV, have lived with HIV for the past 18 years, and I have four children. And <clears throat> there is an issue with our healthcare centers that if you present yourself for antenatal, they won't provide the services unless you go for an HIV test, which is a coercion, even though they don't force you, but they do coerce you because for certain individuals, they can walk out and go to a private doctor who will not do anything that they don't want because they are paying them. But for people who cannot afford that, it might be a problem because this is their only hope. Well, Mickey, your insights are most valuable to the conversation we're having on World AIDS Day worldwide. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you very much for having me as well. You can find more of Mickey's research uh, presented at the ACASA conference in Cape Town on the 9th of December. Uh, Dean Beck there having a very important conversation and you are listening to Joy 94.9's Worldwide AIDS Day broadcast. We'd love you to join the conversation. Please do so at uh, on air at joy.org.au is the email address or you can use the hashtag joy world aids or joy wad we'd certainly love to hear from you we're going to go to a few messages and then continue the conversation with our two representatives from the scarlet alliance janelle forks and cameron cox so please don't go anywhere questions are flooding in keep them coming on here at joy.org.au this is world aids day worldwide this is world aids day worldwide you are listening to Joy 94.9. This is Glenn Dalton. And this hour we are talking about no one being left behind, particularly in relation to we do know that uh, some communities are adversely vulnerable to HIV AIDS. And uh, one of those is sex workers. I'm joined uh, live on the line by two representatives from the Scarlet Alliance, which is an organisation that works towards sex worker rights. Um, Janelle Fawkes is the Chief Executive Officer and and uh, Cameron Cox is the uh, male sex worker representative. Great, thanks. Uh, it's good to speak to you both. Now, we, we, we just heard uh, a little bit um, earlier mm. uh, in regards to the use of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, with the sex workers in the community. If I could go to you, Janelle, what's your opinion on that? Look, um, our own global network, NSWP, the Network of Sex Work Projects, is undertaking its own focus testing right now on the issue. Um, and that some of that was happening at ICAP in Bangkok and different countries are undertaking that over the next few weeks. So there are trials I that are happening. They're not trials. These are um, this is interviews with sex workers, right. um, increasing understanding of the issues and finding out what people um, see as the main issues um, in their different locations, because there will be different impacts in different locations and settings. But I, I think it should be remembered that to be um, HIV positive and a sex worker is illegal, even in several parts of Australia, but also in major areas in our region and the world. So um, there are major barriers. And if you consider that, and if you consider rapid testing, then a whole bunch of ethical and legal considerations come up that need to be taken into account on this issue. How, how do we potentially grapple with both those situations? 
Look, I think we have to, um, as the presenter, as Dean mentioned, um, and was very surprised that sex workers hadn't been consulted with and listened to. That's something we as sex workers are really fighting with um, throughout the region and throughout the world, that um, we need to be heard. We need to, our concerns and considerations really need to be heard about these issues. So when we speak to sex workers in the region, um, even at the recent conference, about this issue of treatment as prevention, it's very clear that sex workers want access to treatment and we want access to prevention. But we know what prevention does work, and that is the kind of prevention that has worked successfully when it has been resourced, but hasn't been resourced enough in the region. So that is community-based organisations mobilising and engaging their own communities or our own communities to develop a response to HIV. And that does include peer education and outreach, provision of equipment, but the advocacy that's about fighting those legal changes we talked about earlier. Many people are very concerned that if a focus um, or if governments see treatment as prevention as the easy tick box and where resourcing should be put, they won't be willing to also um, resource the very important um, support, the very important peer education and prevention approaches that we know are successful. So we want there to be treatment available, but we want the kind of prevention that we know works to also be available. So it's uh, it's quite a uh, quite an interesting, interesting. situation, uh, Cameron. What are, what are your thoughts uh, about this? Look, I completely agree with Janelle on on this issue. Um, the most important phrase, I think, or one of the most important phrases in the previous issue. Uh, interview was nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. People really need to consult sex workers on these issues. Sex workers are the experts on these issues. We've been um, mandating safe sex in Australia, especially here in New South Wales. Sex workers have been using condoms for over 30 years with huge success. And what we really need is for government to keep funding our community-based peer education here and throughout the region so that we continue, continue, continue this work. Okay, but there is a lack of funding and a lack of political will when it comes to sex work. What's your opinion, Cameron, on why sex workers aren't <laughs> consulted about these things? Um, in a lot of uh, places, like, we, we didn't have a seat at the table to start with. Mm -hmm. NGOs and whatever have um, sort of been given priority People don't see sex workers as being articulate or being able to speak on their own issues, um, but we're tremendously articulate and we are experts on our own issues and government should consult us at every step. I know that here on Joy 94.9, we started this year a dedicated program uh, for sex workers and to provide a voice to sex workers, but how else may uh, sex workers get their voice out there or get the message across? Um, we get our message out in many ways. Um, we now sit uh, at the table on uh, many government committees. Individual sex workers um, lobby in many different ways, um, through social media, through um, the mainstream media, um, in our day-to-day -day lives, just by advocating and where we're able to, where some of us are able to stand up publicly and say that we are sex workers. We also have organisations in every state of Australia. In fact, there are sex worker organisations um, in major cities, countries, towns, um, states all around the world. I, I was wondering about that, actually. We certainly are inviting people to uh, share their views on this topic. Uh, you can email honour at joy.org.au or use the Twitter hashtag joy. W A D. Um, Eleanor has uh, written in and uh, with an opinion. I'm interested to hear what uh, both of your reactions to this are. Um, she says uh, rapid testing is not appropriate for sex workers anywhere, and she believes it's unethical, substandard, and unnecessary. Janelle, I wonder your, your reaction to that. Sure. Well, look, um, Scarlet Alliance has been undertaking its own consultation with sex workers in Australia about rapid testing. Um, and look, some of those considerations I raised before are key to this issue. We believe that if rapid testing is offered, then it needs to be a choice. It needs to be one of the often options only. Um, it should not be the only option in any situation. And what is, it, are... what is it about? Could you explain that a little bit more? 
Sure. Well, well for example, um, in Victoria, um, testing is mandated by law for sex workers. Mm -hmm. This is against Australia's own um, policy of voluntary, national policy of voluntary testing being best practice. So sex workers are required to have a test and in some cases that testing occurs in uh, sex industry business locations. If you combine that with the fact that it is illegal in some states and territories for sex workers who are HIV positive or who have an STI, then that could result in instant criminalisation. This is an issue that Empower in Thailand was also raising at um, the recent ICAP conference. Um, it's very concerned that policies like a 100% condom use policy, which also include a mandatory testing requirement, that that could um, that could result in immediate criminalisation of sex workers. Um, Cameron, do you have anything to add um, to that? What are, what are your um, thoughts on rapid like testing? I'm that because we're talking about it in a little bit of sort of abstract terms at the moment. Mm. But if you um, put yourself in the place of a sex worker and say, um, just consider your occupation, say you're working in a bank and there are mandatory tests for bank workers. So one day the mandatory testing people work, walk in, you have to line up, be tested and you test HIV positive. Mm. And all of a sudden you're committing a criminal act by working in that bank. So your whole career life is basically destroyed by that mandatory test. That's what happens would happen to sex workers in that situation. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a pretty... Uh, when, you, when you paint it that way, it's a, a, a very kind of different story, isn't it? Yeah, it's not an abstract thing anymore. So just think how it would affect you in your work if that applied to you. And it was enforced by the police and the courts. Mm. What can uh, the clients of sex workers do to help them to uh, remain healthy? Cameron, I'll start with you. Okay, um, cli clients are usually great. Clients are very condom compliant. Condoms are our first um, line of defence against HIV. And as also mentioned in the other interview, condoms are important to us because they protect against a range of STIs. Mm. Janelle, but, um, so go on. Yes, go on. can I, can oh, I yeah. jump in? Oh, sure. I'd just okay, to say that... Possibly for law reform, which would be a great thing. Okay, and they could resist um, the imp um, imposition of the so-called Swedish model, which also um, aims to criminalise clients and therefore de facto criminalises sex workers as well. So, so what does that actually mean? What right, does, right what, now. the Swedish model? Or? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, the Swedish model is a legislative model that is um, often pushed, um, especially by the left, as a solution to sex work, where, whereby the um, sex worker themselves is not criminalised, but everything to do with their sex work, including their clients, are criminalised, which is actually de facto criminalisation of sex work. It's a sort of Trojan horse legislation um, for criminalising sex work, and it's currently before Parliament in France. Okay, it's um, Janelle. Please add to that. Look, just to say that I exact, I agree completely with what Cameron said. Um, what clients can do, of course, is to be compliant with um, our um, demands for condom use. And as Cameron describes, in Australia, we have a very high, um, we have a strong culture of condom use within um, interactions between sex workers and clients. Um, but on that Swedish model point, yes, right now before the French government is a model that will criminalise uh, the clients of sex workers. But as Cameron describes, it's never just that. For example, in Sweden, if I was to be an individual private worker who had organised my workplace according to my own occupational health and safety needs, um, the person who rented that spot to me would be criminal. So therefore, it's very hard for me to get someone to rent to me. And also the police stake out my premise um, trying to entrap um, clients uh, coming to see me. So my clients don't want to come to my already organised workplace. They want me to meet them in a public spot 
which of course puts me in a very vulnerable situation. So the Swedish model, um, which is being advocated in by some people in Australia, um, is a very problematic model and is, if you like, creeping into different parts, different countries throughout the world. We have a real fight on our hands because for some reason, key feminists and women's groups are really jumping on this bandwagon and it's against all evidence. It would certainly um, have devastating impacts on our ability to, you know, effectively negotiate safe sex practices with our clients, um, but no one seems to be listening to that. You know, there's a lot to be concerned about. Um, I know I asked you a, a little earlier about where do we go from here, yeah. but um, I, mean, I mean, what what is the, the things that need to happen? There's a, a big yeah. attitude shift that um, is is painfully um, needed here. Well, first off, it needs to be recognised that as far as legislative support and enabling environments, sex workers are being left behind, both in Australia, in the region, throughout the world. The HIV sector needs to take that on, governments need to take that on, everyone needs to start listening to us as sex workers. We're very clear on our demands. We're demanding decriminalisation because the evidence shows that it's a best practice model for sex industry regulation and for our human rights and for us to be able to negotiate safe sex practices with our clients. But on top of that, we have some very localised issues that we hope that you might take on as well in Victoria, everyone listening right now. Mandatory STI and HIV testing of sex workers is extremely problematic against Australia's voluntary testing approach. And coming up to Melbourne 2014, we will be running a, main, a major campaign against mandatory testing in Victoria. The health minister there has shifted it from monthly to three monthly, but he has refused to shift it from mandatory compulsory testing, legislative te legislated testing, to compulsory. We really need everyone's support on this. Yeah. Um, what 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 do you think are the major attitudes? What what do you anticipate the reaction to that uh, is going to be like? Look, I think um, we, there's strong evidence. There's health professionals. The Melbourne Sexual Health Clinic um, Centre did its own um, supported uh, research on this issue, and the findings were very clear. When you mandate testing, it means that one group of people who, like, for example, sex workers, who don't actually need to be tested that frequently and don't need to have testing, um, uh, you know, uh, forced upon them, we as sex workers just clog up the public health system if we have to go and have a test at such a ridiculous frequency. When there are people who really need testing, either because they're in a high risk category or because they've, um, they could even be a sex worker who's experienced a broken condom or is symptomatic. So it's the wrong way around. We're forcing people to have tests when we don't need it but when we need to get tests, it's hard to get an appointment. So uh, I guess, again, what I'm saying is we have the evidence, um, we need political will, and at this time coming up to Melbourne 2014, when the spotlight will be on us all in Australia, but particularly on Melbourne, we think that that will be a very good incentive for uh, the Victorian Health Minister and Government to rethink this really draconian policy that no one supports. Uh, how can um, uh, AIDS 2014 support sex workers uh, in terms of achieving some of those things? Cameron, what are your views? <laughs> Um, first of all, by allowing our voices to be heard, 2014 is a very, very important forum and sex worker voices need to be represented and need to be represented on the main stages, not just in back rooms. Yeah. That's, that's, it's so apparent just from uh, all of the literature that that's got to be an important part of it, definitely. Absolutely, and we're having some real problems now. Um, like all major conferences, they're... Um, you know, in Australia, the partnership response has been has really underpinned the success of our um, response to HIV and the low rates of HIV amongst sex workers. We have a real opportunity at Melbourne 2014 to not just for this not to be tokenistic. When we're talking about leaders, 
um, then actually we should have the affected communities. We should have sex workers and drug users and Aboriginal people and gay men up there on the front stage, um, not just um, political leaders, but we should be standing alongside those leaders because really um, we, our communities, have are really critical to the response. Where we are the solution, we're not the problem. Uh, yeah, certainly, um, in, in, really important points there, uh, Cameron. What what, are we, what do you think about it? What what would you like to see as part of AIDS twenty fourteen? Um, well, I'd like to see a lot of things come out of AIDS twenty fourteen. <laughs> what I'd are like the main to, ones? <laughs> the decriminalisation of sex work um, yeah. to come out of AIDS twenty fourteen. I'd like to see a call for the decriminalisation of HIV positive people and transmission where that is criminalised. I'd like to see um, contact tracing eliminated. I'd like to see um, better responses around rapid testing. I'd like to see those governments that are closing their uh, sexual health clinics like they are in, say, Queensland, um, to rethink those strategies. I have a laundry list um, longer than my arm. I, um, well, we can certainly hope. Uh, we've uh, got a few. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, I want to go to both of you for any concluding remarks. Janelle, I'll start with you. Any concluding remarks um, about this really important topic? It's been such a fascinating conversation. Oh, just to say that I had the great opportunity at the recent ICAP conference to see some amazing speakers, some amazing presentations by sex workers from our region and throughout the world. And particularly this year, I was really taken by presentations from Friends Frangipani in Papua New Guinea, Scarlet Timor in Timor-Leste, the Chinese Sex Worker Network, um, SAN, uh, the project, oh, sorry, the um, sex worker group in um, Fiji, um, our own uh, regional network, APNSW, APNSW, the Asia Pacific Network mm -hmm. of Sex Workers, but also Myanmar. Um, sex worker group there called TOPS. If we allow those um, sex workers from the region to speak on for themselves, if you allow us to speak for ourselves, we can do it and we can really get our voices across. So we thank you for the opportunity to be part of this. I, I think you're exactly right in terms of we are not asking the right people about these kinds of things. And um, there's a, a lot of evidence there and there are also a lot of um, stigmatised attitudes uh, mm. towards uh, sex workers, which is clearly holding us back and is increasing that level of vulnerability um, to HIV AIDS for sex worker uh, communies. Absolutely. Um, well, what about for, what about to you, Cameron? What uh, can I ask? Uh, any concluding remarks that you'd uh, like to make about the topic? Um, yeah, I was also in the same position at ICAP and it was really amazing to see sex workers from sex worker organisations all around the Asia Pacific being so articulate and committed to sex worker causes. For me it was especially um, amazing because there were male sex workers from most of the projects that Janelle uh, mentioned and some of the presentations given were absolutely amazing it shows that sex workers can speak for themselves and it really should be nothing about us without us well i think certainly the uh the voice needs to be heard and we need to be listening to the voice uh janelle and cameron thank you so much for joining me this afternoon on uh, this very special broadcast and uh, i can only wish you all of the best in uh the work uh, very important work that you continue to do uh, at the scarlet uh, alliance Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you are listening to Joy 94.9. We certainly uh, invite your comments uh, throughout this broadcast, which is uh, continuing right through till uh, 6 a.m. tomorrow morning here in Melbourne. You can easily get in touch with us. Uh, all you've got to do is uh, email onair at joy.org.au or you can use the hashtag Joy World AIDS Day. Now, this topic is a big part of um, a whole range of topics that are occurring uh, throughout the day and throughout this very special broadcast. So I invite you to certainly go onto the website, which is worldaidsdayworldwide.org. Not only can you see the huge rundown of various topics, you can also uh, stream 
stream live and see vision. Uh, there's cameras set up uh, live in the studio and uh, with our various Skype interview, uh, various interviewees um, around the world. Uh, this does showcase a range of experts uh, in the area. Um, so uh, coming up next is uh, Matt McDonnell, who's going to be speaking about stepping up the pace, particularly in relation to the uh, tuberculosis co-infection. I've I've been Glenn Dalton. The news at three o'clock is coming up. Certainly don't go anywhere. You're on Joy 94.9.